Well, praise God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Greetings from the Potter's House Church of God. That's where we come from down in Mystic, Connecticut. And I'm traveling this morning with my wife, Melissa, our son, Seth. And you guys can greet the congregation. Oh. <laughs> Everything to say. Hi, good welcome, morning. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Pastor Bruce, for having us here this morning. Absolutely. Good to come up to New Hampshire. Several weeks ago, as I was um, sleeping in the early morning, I had a dream of, there's been times in the past where God speaks to me uh, through dreams, and um, this is one of the first times that it's happened for quite a while now. As I was dreaming, a man was preaching in the dream, and he was preaching out of Psalm 93, and I think that's fitting for what the Lord laid upon my heart this morning to bring with you guys. And if you'll turn me there, we'll open up in Psalm 93. It's a very short psalm, but I think it's got a, a big message. Psalm 93. It says, The Lord reigns. He's clothed with majesty. The Lord's clothed with strength. Wherewith he's girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established of old. You are everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. Yea, than, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becomes your house, O Lord. Amen. If you guys bow your heads, we'll pray for the anointing on the Word of God. Lord, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for another opportunity to proclaim your gospel, Lord. God, we pray for an anointing upon the preaching of the Word this morning, Lord. Hide your servant upon your cross, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for an open heaven this day, O oh God. And Lord, that you might speak clearly to this congregation, Lord. Give us ears to hear what your spirit would say. Give us hearts to receive the good word of God, Lord, and a mind to understand the holy scriptures today, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit take control in this place this day, O oh God. Let us say it's been good to come to your house this morning, we pray. In the name of Jesus. In that psalm there, it's a very short psalm, five, five verses, but I believe it speaks volumes into our life that we're living in here in 2015. I would say that we're living in a time that the New Testament speaks of as perilous times, a time of um, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, a time that the disciples questioned Jesus on how it was going to be in the time of the end and the sign of his coming. And he said that there would be times of false Christs and wars and talk of wars and nation rising against nation and kingdom rising against kingdom and famines and earthquakes and pestilences and fearful sights. And he told them through all that, he says that he that would endure until the end would be saved. And in your patience that you should possess your souls. And uh, we're seeing these things begin to unravel as the days go by and... Um, Things are coming closer and closer to a culmination of the, of the end time events unraveling and the time of Christ's return, I believe, is very near. You know, we're not here to set dates this morning. No man knows the day or the hour, but of the times and seasons, brethren, we don't need to be ignorant. As we read the Holy Scriptures, we can see that Christ's return is coming soon. Amen. Amen. And God is up. Uh, the scripture teaches us in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew 24 that when, the, when these times begin to unravel and the, the end of the age is, is about ready to, to happen, that it's, it's some of the worst times in history for all mankind. And we know that the world has seen many times in history where things went really sour for the people of God and for the inhabitants of the world. And you know, but God is the, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God that's able to, to protect us through the hard times. 
The psalmist saw him as his buckler and as his shield and as his fortress and as his high tower, his refuge and his hiding place. And we know the psalmist David went through many serious and hard times in his life. He was anointed to be the king over Israel as a young teenage man. And uh, that didn't happen for probably over a decade after that. As he, as he, um, after he had defeated the, the giant Goliath, we know that Saul began to be, become jealous of David. As David went out, he became a commander in the army, and he began to, to have great conquest in the battles that Israel faced. And um, the women came rejoicing over David and saying, you know, they're singing and dancing, and David, he slew ten thousands, and, and Saul slew thousands. And because of the the, 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 the honor that David was receiving, Saul became, he became jealous over David and, and, uh, and tried to take his life several times through a javelin at him. And David was driven into a hard place with the anointing of God upon his life as the, the next king in Israel. You know, the blessing of God, the, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the one that wrote us many of these psalms when we draw strength and comfort from here. Even in 2015, this man found himself in a very dark place, a very a very hard place. How many of you have ever been there? A place of suffering, a place of, um, of, of seeming like abandonment, a place where he, he's running for his very life from, from his father-in-law. And this went on not just for a few weeks or not just for a few months, but this went on for, for several years, probably over a decade. David is running from a, for his life in a hard, hard place. But our message this morning is something that Paul said in the book of Philippians as, a, as an older saint. And um, we, know, we know the apostle Paul went through many things himself as a great apostle of Christ. But in the book of Philippians, he comes to a place in life, he, he's in prison for the cause of Christ now. And he's writing, this, he's writing this letter to the Philippians as a man that's at the end of his ministry now. And he suffered many things in the behalf of Christ. The Bible says that he, 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 was, um, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked. He was whipped. He was, um, he, he was in fastings often. He was in painfulness. He was in watchings often. He had the care of all the churches upon his back. He was persecuted but not abandoned. Cast down but not forsaken. Paul, he would, he, he would, they were considered like, like fools for Christ. You know, they hungered. They, they were buffeted. They had no certain dwelling place. I mean, this is a great apostle who wrote us about half the New Testament. But now he's at the end of his life. He's in prison. And he says it, about halfway through that book in Philippians chapter 3, he says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Now we like that part, amen? Amen. We want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. We want to see the Holy Ghost working through our lives and laying hands upon the sick like our sister was testifying this morning and watch the sick recover. We want to cast out demons in His name and prophesy the wonderful works of God. But Paul didn't want to just know Him and the power of His resurrection, but he wanted to know Him in another way. He says, I want to know Him in the power of His resurrection, and I want to know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. Amen. Now, 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 many congregations are not going to embrace the gospel that Paul was portraying to us that day when he wrote that letter. It's still bringing comfort to Christians today. I want to know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. And myself, over the last several years, I've had an opportunity to, to know Christ in the fellowship of His sufferings. And I've known Him for a long time now. Since 1988, I came to the faith. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and 
Soon after the Lord gifted me with the gift of prophecy, I've laid hands upon sick people at times and they've recovered. I've seen Christ and I've known him in the, in the, in the power of his resurrection. Amen. But I'm starting to know him over the last few years in the fellowship of his sufferings. Now we know that when Christ is looking down upon our earth today in 2015 and you know as we see the testimonies of, of the victorious church in the book of Acts that if we would analyze ourselves as the church of 2015 and, and make a right comparison to the, to the book of Acts we know that we're not seeing the church operate the way that it operated in the book of Acts. Right. And I know that, that Christ the loving Savior he can't be well pleased with what he sees. Amen. Amen. And, and I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. as, he, as, he, as he's concerned about the church and he's concerned about the, the people that are part of the church and he's concerned about your life and, and my life. I think of in the Old Testament scriptures and the book of Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 61, he says, he, you know, he was looking for an, inter, an intercessor. He looked down, looking for an intercessor. And Ezekiel, he says, I sought for a man among them that might stand in the gap and make up the hedge. He says, but I couldn't find any. Looking down from heaven, the eyes of the Lord, they're running to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. He's looking for people that their heart's in the right place. Mm -hmm. They've gone through some things. I think of the soul winner in the book of Psalms. It says that those that go forth sowing in tears will doubtless come again with rejoicing, carrying the precious sheep. When our heart is broken and contrite before the Lord, we can affect people, amen, in a way that we could never affect them if our heart stays hardened and not in the right place. Right. I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. And it took a serious event in my life that happened a little over two years ago. I'm a painting contractor also. I, I preach, and, but, but, but I, paint, I paint houses for a living. And, about a little over two years ago, in, in, in April, about two years ago, we were out power washing a house for about five or six hours. And um, at the end of that day, I, I had this serious ringing that was taking place in my ear. I don't know if you've had, any of you have ever experienced that. They call it tinnitus. I didn't even know yeah. there was a name for it. I didn't even know such a thing. But this ringing was taking place in my ear. And it wouldn't go away. It got to be so distressful for a few days, I couldn't even hardly sleep. And I, f I finally went to the ear doctor. And he, he, he diagnosed my ears and uh, sent me in for a hearing test. And I found out I had 20% hearing loss in my right ear. And um, he was a little concerned. But, um, you know, based on my age, I mean, I'm 57 now. I was about 55, 54 then. Um, he wrote it off as just old age, you know, that... You know, as you get older, your ears break down and um, you don't hear as good as you used to. So I said, you know, is it need for have any further testing, you know? He said, well, you could go in for an MRI. You know, there's a real outside chance that you could have a tumor, you know, but um, he, didn't, he didn't recommend that. So I went on and I said, well, what do I do? He says, there's nothing we can do for you. There's nothing we can do for you. You know, and, and the receptionist, she was a friend of mine from high school. You know, she knew I was pretty distressed. She goes, well, just ignore it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a man that loves peace and quiet. You know, here I got this sound going off in my head, and I can't stop it. And there's no medicine that they can give me. There's no surgery. There's no operation. There's no specialist I can go to. It's just that I got to deal with this thing. I'm talking about knowing him in the fellowship of his sufferings. And this went on for, for, for time, and you can ask my wife, it's like, I had trouble sleeping at night, and I'm still trying to hold on a job, which I did by the grace and the mercy of God, I continued on. I had, I had, um, I had booked several revivals that year, and we had some revivals to go to, and time went on, and it's like, you know, I was having trouble getting through the day, but... 
You know, I started really seeking God during that time. How many knows when you're in a hard place that, that you'll seek God, amen? If you're ever going to seek God, when you find yourself in a hard place, You'll seek God. And I started praying and I started fasting and, and doing several, you know, longer fasts, three or four days at a time. And I'm seeking God and God's given me the grace to continue on. And we find ourselves in, in, in those revivals and uh, the one revival went good. And then, um, but about halfway through that revival, I started getting a little uneasy on my feet. When I closed my eyes, I started having some balance issues. And now I got some new symptoms here, and I started getting a new noise in my ear that I hadn't heard before, and it's like I'm really starting to um, get panicked. But there was a lot of grace upon my life. You know, we're in revival now. We're preaching revival. We're fasting. We're praying. Other people are praying and fasting, and the grace of God is upon my life. So we got through both those revivals. But when I get back to Connecticut, the revivals are over now. You know, all the the, the heavy emphasis on prayer and fasting, it's not, not as much as it was in now it's December, and I'm starting to get some new symptoms. It's like I'm starting to get really anxious about what I, I, I'm visiting the computer again. I'm looking through the um, Googling on, on what this thing could be, and I'm starting to figure out, you know, that maybe there's something more seriously wrong than just tinnitus in my ears. And I, and I call back to the ENT again, and um, I explain to him what's going on. He says, well, you should go in for an MRI. You know, and here I'm a faith guy now. I've been saved uh, almost 27 years now at this point. And it's like, you know, I'm praying, I'm fasting. I know God can heal. I've seen him work miracles before. Amen. I'm a faith guy. I'm, I don't, you know, if there's anything wrong, I'm going to put it in the hands of God. Right. But it got to be such to a point where I couldn't even hardly function. It's like I couldn't even hardly sleep at night. And I finally, I, it was like the Lord, he was driving me to face my fears. And I went and I had that MRI. And I'm still standing in faith. I'm waiting for the results. And I came back. The results came back. And I found out I had an acoustic neuroma tumor on my inner ear. It had gone down through the ear canal. And it was just starting to touch my brain. And when I, when I got the report back from the doctor, it's like, how many knows when you get a bad report, your, your heart sinks? Yeah. It's like, I, I'm, I'm a man of faith, but... I got a brain tumor now that's touching my brain and my heart sunk. And it's like, you know, I'm used to hearing the voice of God many times through the years. I mean, God is always speaking. You know, I pray and um, I seek God and God speaks. He gives me sermons to preach. You know, the, you know, I rely upon God to get the right sermon for the right congregation. And, you know, but here I am. I have to live my sermons now. You know, I preach about faith, and I preach about eternal life, and I preach about, you know, trusting in God. But it's easy to preach about those things. But it's another thing to live that thing out experientially. You know, when you know, when I start Googling again, and I start reading all the symptoms and all the, all the complications that could take place if I do go through with this surgery, you know, I could end up with an aneurysm. I could end up with, with meningitis. You know, I could end up with a CSF leak. I could end up crippled in a wheelchair. You know, I could lose my life, maybe a 2% to 5% chance, but if, if I didn't have the right surgeon, I could lose my life during the surgery. You know, I have a, a younger wife now, and I have children, and I, I'm gonna leave them behind now, you know? And I'm used to God speaking to me, and I'm seeking God for an answer. You know, God, what's going to become of me? What's going to become of my life? And God's staying silent. I'm talking about knowing Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. You know, there's no testimony unless you go through a test. Amen? Amen. Right. And uh, sometimes, you, sometimes you, you know, God, God can deliver you from the fiery furnace. But sometimes he wants to take you like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he wants to take you through the fiery furnace. Amen? Amen? I mean, God can deliver you from the lion's den, but sometimes he wants to take you like Daniel and take you right into the lion's den to face your fears. Amen? Yes. To show you that he's trustworthy, yes. even in the midst of the storm. Amen? Yes. He's trustworthy, even in the midst of the hard place. Always. And I went to that... Um, 
I went to the ENT specialist. And um, he told me that you, you need to have a surgery. You know, I said, well, you know, there's other options. You know, well, it's beyond the point to watch and wait. You know, it's touching your brain now. There, that's not an option. You know, and the other option was we could take the gamma knife and we could zap it with the gamma knife. But really, that's not the best option, he said. And I didn't like that option either. He says, your, your, your only really viable option is surgery. And he told me going into the surgery, he says, you're going to lose your hearing in your right ear. And he goes, you're going to have tinnitus the rest of your life. You know? But God is bigger than all this stuff. Amen? Amen. And um, I, I, I took that surgery. You know, I had it in, um, it was around March about two years ago. And I went through that surgery. And, um, but before the surgery, you know, I told you God wasn't speaking to me. That's when I'm, you know, months were going on now. And God's staying silent. But right about a week or so before the surgery, my mother spoke, spoke a word into my, into my life. And then I, another preacher spoke to me the same, basically the same word in Isaiah chapter 41.10. He said, I'm the Lord your God. And I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. You know, I, I, I'm going to help you. I'm going to strengthen you. And I'm going to uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Amen. You know, I, I, up until that point, I didn't know if I was going to survive the surgery, what was going to become of me. But I knew God was going to see me through that surgery at that point. I went into that surgery with confidence. And um, this guy that, that did the surgery, he was like the head of neurology at Yale Hospital. You know, very influential doctor. You know, been doing surgeries for years. And I went through that surgery. He talked to me afterwards, maybe a few weeks after, a month or so after. He goes, you set a new standard. <laughs> Praise God. He goes, it doesn't get any better than yes, that, the Jesus. outcome. Now, when I came out of that surgery, I mean, I wasn't looking Jesus. very good. I had a little bit of Bell's palsy in my face. They told me that that was going to happen because they had to touch the facial nerve yeah. at the time. Yeah, a little bit. And they had one lady just... Um, that was her whole job during the course of the surgery. There was about 15 people in the surgery room. And her job was to, to, to um, keep an eye on the facial nerve. If the doctor got too close, he was to tell her. But, you know, to get the whole tumor, if they leave any behind, you could have a regrowth. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the same thing again. So they wanted to get it all, so they had to touch the facial nerve a little bit. So I had a little Bell's palsy in my face. But that went away. He said, he said as long as they didn't compromise the facial nerve too much, you'd be all right. And my eye wouldn't cry in the beginning. You know, my right eye. You know, I mean, I was, I was really, really went through the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. 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 Really began to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, now I had my wife was with me. My pastor was with me at the time. And another sister from the church um, right after the surgery. They stayed with me for hours. But now everybody's going home now. And I'm sitting in the ICU. I just went through this surgery. And God was there, amen? Amen. I knew him in the fellowship of his sufferings. As, a, as I'm pouring my heart out to him, the Lord was ministering to me in this hard place. Glory. Glory. And he saw me through. About, about, about four or five weeks later, I'm back to work. Yeah. You know? And it's like nothing ever happened at this point. I mean, I still have the tinnitus. I still suffer with that uh, off and on. About two, two out of three days, um, it doesn't bother me at all. But about one out of three, it bothers me somewhat. But you know what? Sometimes God leaves a thorn in the flesh. That's right. Amen? That's right. To keep us on the cutting edge. That we might not forget what, what, what's going on and who's in charge. Amen? Amen. And, and Paul, Paul says it. You know, I learned to glory in my infirmities. I learned to glory in my necessities and my reproaches. Because when I'm weak, then His power is strongest yes. in my life. Yes. I think of Christ Himself as the, the great Savior of the world. And we love the picture of the little baby Jesus in the manger. You know, we like the... The, the, the good looking man we see, you know, as our Lord and Savior, the, the pictures they portray of him, you know, with a nice smile on his face. 
But he, he was bruised. He was rejected. We esteemed him not. He was a man of sorrows, the Bible says. He was acquainted with grief. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we're made whole. But Jesus went through more than we'll ever think about going through. Yes, he did. His closest friends at the most toughest time in his life. He's looking for prayer support in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he's ready to go to the cross and he asks the disciples, he comes back and he finds them sleeping. Mm -hmm. And he tells them, you know, couldn't you guys just tarry with me an hour? You know, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Right. He's looking for prayer support, but he can't find any. And when they come to take him away, all of his closest guys there that he spent the last three years plus with, they all scattered. One of his close guys, one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, betrayed him. He was labeled a fraud. He was labeled a blasphemer. He was labeled a glutton and a drunkard. Criminal. Jesus had a hard life. He wasn't a homeowner. The women of the day, they ministered to his needs. Jesus didn't even have enough money to pay his taxes. He sent Peter fishing to get tax money for Peter and himself. Mm -hmm. Jesus lived a hard life. Right. We're called to follow in his steps. And I'm not trying to preach a doom and gloom message here where we all have to be miserable and look like the frontest piece of the book of Lamentations. I mean, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We're to be full of joy and rejoice in the Lord always and be at peace. But I'm telling you, it's not easy to live in this life. And it's not always going to be a, a bed of roses as the televangelists have been telling us for years. They're preaching another gospel, telling us that if you just have enough faith, that you'll have all the resources that you ever need, that you'll be blessed a hundredfold going out, a hundredfold coming in. Well, sometimes there might not be enough money to meet the bills. And sometimes you just might get sick. And sometimes people just might get sick and die. That's the reality of life. Amen. But that's not what they teach us. The Bible warns against another gospel. And another Christ. That's not the gospel that's going to sustain you when you get diagnosed with a, a brain tumor or you get diagnosed with cancer or your house just burns down or you lose your job and, you, and you've been living from week to week. That gospel will not sustain you through the hard times of life. Mm. But to know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings and in the power of his resurrection. In other words, I want to know him experientially in every way, Paul's saying. Amen. This is an old man now. He's, in, he's incarcerated when he's, when, he's, when he's saying this. Paul went through his hard times. A night and a day he spent in the deep. Watchings, fastings, painfulness, sorrow, the cares of the churches. Shipwrecked. Bit, bit by a snake. The guy went through it. And we're going to go through it. The Bible says that Jesus in all points, he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. Amen. In all points, tempted like we are. That tells me that I'm going to go through some things. You know, when I, when I, when I signed up for the... To, to become a soldier in the army of God, I changed ranks from the devil's army and enlisted in the army of God. Glory. Amen. Glory. But making that, making that stand in life, the devil didn't just roll over and play dead. Amen. Amen. Because when he had me, he didn't have to bother with me. But now that I'm against him and I know his ways, and I served him for 20-something years. I know how he is. And I'm of greater, I'm of greater danger to him now in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because I know what he's about. And I can rescue.
rescue people from him and from his lies and from his deceits. Amen. So he's going to come after me in a greater way. And he's going to come after you in a greater way. Because when you, when you receive the precious Holy Spirit, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But you still have to access that power on a daily basis. You still got to keep coming back to the well and drinking of the water of life on a daily basis. The Bible says don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, the drunkard's got to keep drinking. And if you want to stay filled with the Spirit, you've got to keep drinking in the Spirit. Because you need the power of the Holy Spirit to stand against the things that we deal with in this life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There's many examples in the Bible of people that have been through some things. Not one of us in here, I'm sure, has ever suffered anywhere near in comparison to the life of the man called Job. We can read his report. He was the richest man of the East. He feared God. He eschewed evil. God commended him before Satan when Satan came and questioned him about his servant, servant Job. He said, there's none like him. This guy, he fears God. He eschews evil. He gets up early in the morning. He prays for his family. He offers up sacrifices. This guy's getting the job done. How many knows it rains on the just and the unjust? I mean, no, it's just because you're, you're getting the job done doesn't mean that one day that Roman soldiers might not drive nails through your hands and through your feet. Yeah. Amen. Amen. How many knows that you might not find yourself one day on the island called Patmos as a prisoner for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ like John did? Amen. How many knows that one day that if your name is Peter who preached to... Th preached to 3,000 people in the book of Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 got saved, and went on, and, and, and a chapter or so later, he healed a crippled man that was begging by the gate, and another 5,000 got saved. But Jesus told him in the book of John in the last chapter, that one day that someone's going to take you where you don't want to go. In other words, you're going to get crucified just like me, Peter, one day, when you're an old man. It's not always going to be easy. And it's not always going to be easy for me and you, my friends. But he that endures until the end, the same will be saved. I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. I don't want to be like those in the book of Matthew that, 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 that they said they did wonderful works in his name. And they laid hands upon the sick and they casted out devils in his name. But he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of wickedness. I never knew you. Right. In other words, you didn't know me experientially. You knew a little bit about me, but you didn't know me the way I wanted to know you. He's coming back for the bride of Christ, for the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Those that know him. Right. Those that know him intimately. Amen. Those that know his heart. Amen. Amen. That's what he's looking for this morning. Amen. And I think, I'm telling you, nobody suffered like Job suffered. In a day's time, <laughs> he was the richest man of the East. He lost all of his wealth. And he lost all of his children in a day's time. But still, he didn't charge God foolishly with his mouth. Amen. Amen. He didn't murmur. He didn't complain. The Lord gives. And the Lord takes away. Right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. How many know that Satan doesn't give up easy though? Amen. He came again. You know, he told God, you know, you've hedged in his way on every side. I can't get to him, in other words. I'm trying to break through, but, but I, can't, I can't get to him the way that I want to. He says skin for skin. You let, me lay hand, you let me touch his health, and he'll curse you to your face, Satan told God. And God gave Satan permission to, to put Job to the test. He says, you can do whatever you want to his body, but you can't take his life. Amen. God's in charge, amen? Not even a little sparrow can fall to the ground and die without the permission of Almighty God. 
And God's more, God's more concerned about you being developed into the character of the Lord Jesus Christ than he is with your temporary comfort yeah. in 2015. That's true. If he's got to allow you to be like the young teenage boy Joseph who dreamed dreams and his brother got jealous in the book of Genesis and because of their jealousy he got sold into slavery down into Egypt and to make matters worse he got falsely accused as a rapist and incarcerated in the prisons of Egypt the Bible says they put his feet in fetters they kept him in iron stocks he was in pain and suffering in the prison cell and he had done no harm to nobody he wanted to maintain his integrity and didn't want to have sexual relations with another man's wife and because of that he finds himself in a very hard place Amen. 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 It's not always because of sin that you find yourself in a hard place. Sometimes that God wants to be glorified in your life. Sometimes that God wants to position you to the place he needs you to be at the proper time. God knew that there was a famine coming upon the whole world. And if he didn't have a man in position in Egypt under a Gentile government, an ungodly reign, then all his people would get wiped out. Right. He needed to position Joseph down in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Joseph went the way of suffering. And sometimes me and you got to go the way of suffering. Mm -hmm. Because we want to know him yeah. if we're wise right. in the fellowship of his sufferings. That's right. It says, I'd rather be in the house of mourning than in the house of mirth. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes. Wise man Solomon wrote that. Doesn't make a lot of sense to most Christians in 2015. But I think I understand what he's saying. When I'm in the house of mourning and I'm, and, and I'm, and I'm broken, then I'm right at the place where God can use me the greatest. Amen. Amen. Because until we get out of the way and we're not trying to touch the glory and we're not trying to get in the way of Christ being glorified in our lives, God can't do too much with us. But when we take the low place, amen, when we begin to humble ourselves, I heard our, our sister quoted in the, in, the, in, the, in the prayer meeting this morning, I love that, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people that are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then would I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. When we begin to take the low place, amen, we're setting ourselves up for victory. Amen. Amen. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James put it this way. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. Let your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of God and he will lift you up. Amen. I'm not going to be lifted up, amen, with the glory of the Lord upon my life and the joy of God and the peace. Not for me to be lifted up to get a name for myself, but that the Son of God might be glorified through my life. Amen. 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 So Job suffered, got sores, broke, broke out through his whole body. But began to scrape his sores so he could find some relief from the pain. And his wife tells him, well, why don't you just curse God and die, Job? What a thing to tell your husband, huh? Yeah. Why don't you just give up, Job, in other words? God's not working. This is not the God we heard on television that says if we'll send in our offering that we're going to be blessed. This is not what I heard, that, that, that if I just send in enough offerings, I'll never be sick. I don't, I don't hear it. This is not it. Just curse God and die, Job. And then add, to add insult to injury, his closest friends. How many of us, sometimes you can't find, you know, comfort from your family members, maybe, because maybe they know you and they, you know, they think, you know, maybe you deserve what you got. Oh, yeah. But we should be able to find comfort from our friends. Amen? Amen. Job's closest friends come to him. Job's having the worst time of his life. He just lost all of his wealth. He lost... His family, his children. He lost his relationship with his wife. 
and he's losing his health, he's not sure of his future, it could be short-lived. And his friends saying, Job, if you weren't such a sinful man, none of this would have ever happened to you. You're such a sinful man, that's why you're in such a predicament that you're in. But how many knows that Job is beginning to, he's beginning to learn Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings? See, if you never go through something, you can't understand all that the Savior went through when he's, when he's bleeding on an old rugged cross, his life's blood's being poured out. People on, on the bottom, that they're looking upon him, they're crazy. Why don't you just come down from the cross and save yourself? And then we'll believe. They spit upon him. They whipped him. They bruised his body. He was so beaten, he was hardly recognized as a man. Suffered and died on an old rugged cross. I want to know him that way. I want to know what he experienced when he kept the faith. Dying on an old rugged cross, his life's blood being poured out. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's still ministering. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He died a, di a death of a victor. Many people are still being ministered today because of the work that Christ did on the cross. I don't like this cross that these Hollywood preachers preach to me of this glorious life as a Christian. I mean, it would be nice if it was true, but the cross is an instrument of suffering and death. And the Bible tells me I've got to take up my cross daily and follow Him. Amen. Paul says, I die daily. I'm talking about living this life as a victor for Christ, enduring hardship as a loyal soldier in the army of God, no matter what it takes, no matter what I go through, no matter what kind of pain and suffering, because the more I go through, the more I can relate to other people and I can console them with the consolation that rests upon my life. The more I go through, the more beneficial I am to the kingdom of God because I can relate to people by the things that I went through and the experiences that life taught me. Amen. I couldn't relate to sick people before I had a brain tumor the way I can relate to them now. But now when I pray for them, I can pray with a new fervency yes. and a new expectancy. And I can pray with more passion and conviction because I know what they're going through. They're suffering like I suffer. Amen. Amen. And God wants to do that for us, each one of us. But we resist that because the flesh is weak and we don't like to suffer. We don't like the pain that we go through. But we're not in heaven yet, my friends. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And we haven't yet reached heaven. We haven't yet reached a place where there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain, there's no more suffering, there's no more death. We're still fighting a good fight of faith trying to lay hold of eternal life. And I want to know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings as I go through this hard time in an alien place, in a strange land. I'm looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. Amen? Amen. One day I want to walk the streets of gold with Him. One day I want to sit down at the marriage wedding supper of Him. Yes. And I want him to be able to tell me, John, well done, thou good and faithful yes, servant. Yes. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Amen. You were able to relate to the people that were cast down. And you sowed, you sowed good seed into their life. And because of your work, for my cause of my gospel, many were saved. Amen. Amen. People can't relate to us when we're in pride and we're in arrogance and we can't, we're unrelatable. But when we when we, we begin to know Christ, amen, amen, in the fellowship of his sufferings. And he's going to try to take each one of us to that place, yeah, yeah. to know him that way. Because oh, yeah. he wants us to know him in, in every, every way. You know, we're the bride of Christ, amen? amen. The bride knows her husband completely if she's a good bride. And that's the way that God wants us to know him, amen? amen. He wants us to know him completely. God loves you this morning, my friends. And I know that probably that God didn't send me up here to bring this message because I'm the only one that can live this message and understand it. I'm sure there's people in this room that have been suffering. I, I tell you, I don't really know anybody 
You know, I've, I've been a Christian almost half my life now. I don't know anybody right now that's not going through something. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, that the time that judgment must first begin in the house of God. Now, how many knows that God's coming back for a church that's without spot or blemish? You know, no imperfections. A holy church. And we're not quite there yet, most of us. But God, in His love and in His mercy and in His grace, He allows us to suffer under the heat of the refiner's fire. As He burns off the imperfections of our lives, He turns up the heat and the dross goes away. And He begins to look down into the metal that's, be that's become refined. And He begins to see His own reflection in the metal yes. and He knows it's ready. Hallelujah. Amen. As we suffer for the cause of Christ, one day we inherit eternal life. Yes. Amen. Never to die again in a place where a million years is just the beginning. Look forward to that place. Amen? Amen. I'm glad I could share this message with you this morning. I know it's not a, a, a jumping and shouting type of message, but I hope it's brought some understanding to your life. Of maybe some of the things that you've been going through, they're not in vain. Right. Amen. Amen. God's refining you. God's, God, God, God's, God's dealing with you as a good parent. It says that he chastens all, all whom he loves. You know, he, he scourges every son whom he receives, that we might be a partaker of his holiness. That once we've been exercised in this way, we, 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 we can learn the peaceable fruit of righteousness, it says. It says when God's judgments are in the earth, in Isaiah 26, it says the inhabitants thereof, then they learn righteousness. You know, when God, when, God, when God punishes us when we need it, He deals with us as a good parent, and He helps us to live a better life in the future if we're wise. Amen? Right. Praise God. Oh, yeah. Pastor Ruth. Yes. 